Now tonight, we're just honored to have this really extraordinary gentleman in the field of scholarship. Um, he's the professor emeritus of political science at the University of California, San Diego, which has one of the strongest political science departments anywhere in America. One of the things that happens though, that stuff seems to get lost in our city. They understand it in a lot of other places, but he's one of the very best and his works of scholarship, looking at the Congress and a lot of other issues um, is just enormously impressive and we're lucky to have him with us tonight. Welcome please, Dr. Gary Jacobson. <clears throat> I want to thank George Metrovich for having invited me to talk to this group. Um, this is something I do in election season. It's always fun because I don't, we don't really know what's happened yet, so we can speculate a lot. Um, normally, when I'm doing a talk like this, the, the subject is trying to explain what the outcome is going to be, and I will uh, talk a little bit about that. But um, the real question that this uh, election raises is uh, how did Donald Trump ever get to where he is now in the first place? Uh, just, just for to uh, pose the question for the evening. <laughs> I, I, I think the answer is no, but it's not a dead certain. It's it's not a dead done certainty quite yet. Um, the reasons why Trump should not be in this place are legion. Uh, first of all, his nomination was opposed by almost the entire Republican establishment, elected leaders, uh, elder statesmen, uh, uh, elder statesmen, most uh, traditional campaign contributors, uh, and a large and prominent segment of the conservative uh, commentariat. Um, an example, my favorite example is from, from a columnist named Peter Boehner, who writes things for the, the Washington Post from time to time. He wrote this in January. Mr. Trump's virulent combination of ignorance, emotional instability, demagogy, solipsism, and vindictiveness would do more than result in a failed presidency. It could very well lead to a national catastrophe. The prospect of Donald Trump as a commander in chief should send a chill down the spine of every American. If Mr. Trump heads the Republican Party, it will no longer be a conservative party. It will be an angry, bigoted, populist one. Okay, that's, that's pretty powerful words, and you can find other examples of it at that time. This is in January uh, of the election year. I, I, will, I, I will skip forward and let you know that Wayner also said he would never vote for Hillary Clinton. And if you want to know something about polarization in American politics, that illustrates it in one quote and one column. Um, no fewer than 22 of the uh, conservative movement luminaries, people like Glenn Beck, L. Brent Brozell, Mona Charon, Eric Erickson, William Crystal, uh, Yuval Levin, Edwin Meese III, John Podoritz, uh, Thomas Sowell, a long list, all signed a manifesto saying never Trump, that they opposed Trump. Every living former Republican president <coughs> opposed Trump, former candidates opposed Trump, uh, et cetera. He was supported by a handful of uh, congressmen and some conservative talk radio personalities, some of the Fox News pundits, but by and large, everybody who was either a Republican or a serious conservative, uh, didn't want Trump. Nonetheless, he got the nomination. Um, uh, he got the nomination actually quite handily. He led from within a month of his announcement in June that he was running. He was the leading candidate among Republicans. Uh, and he remained so throughout the campaign. There were times when people said, oh, he's reached his, he's reached his plateau. You can see in that red line there, there's a kind of a plateau, but then it goes up again. Um, furthermore, from the perspective of kind of uh, uh, ordinary Republicans, the strongest op opponents of him at various times were also unorthodox people. Uh, ben Carson in this line here, and then uh, Ted Cruz, the blue line there. Kasich was the last remaining sort of establishmentarian uh, in the Republican Party. He didn't get very far. So Trump didn't just win, he really won big. He took over. It was a, a clear hostile takeover of the Republican Party by Donald Trump, and it showed the disconnect between the party's uh, intellectual and political leaders 
and its followers and the, and the Republican base. A second reason why Trump should never have got the nomination is that he was widely regarded not only by prominent figures in both parties and across the political spectrum as lacking the experience, temperament, knowledge, and character to qualify for the presidency. Clear majorities of the general public agree with that assessment. Um, this is from an average of, uh, uh, averages of a bunch of polls that have been taken by YouGov over the course of the election, uh, asking people, um, uh, some of the YouGov, some of them are from other sources, asking uh, whether or not various terms apply to Donald Trump. And as you can see, uh, large proportions, almost half think he's corrupt, more than a majority thinks he's racist, crazy, dangerous, not honest and trustworthy, not qualified, have an unfavorable opinion, not the right temperament, and not prepared. Those are pretty remarkable numbers for a guy who's on the ballot in, uh, in 50 states for the President of the United States. Uh, he earned these numbers by showing remarkable ignorance of the basic institutional features of the political system, fundamentals of US foreign and domestic policy, and absolutely no inclination to learn anything more about them in the course of his campaign. He's notoriously indifferent to facts, um, uh, uh, continually repeats uh, bogus de debunked claims that he makes again and again. He said, the fact checkers have gone crazy uh, uh, following him. Uh, he's got a business career that's uh, been successful in some respects, but is checkered with uh, shady dealings, stiffing stockholders, stiffing suppliers um, through bankruptcy and other kinds of negotiations, a phony university that's now being, uh, would be a trial about it in San Diego maybe. Right over here, 28th of November. Um, uh, he's got a charitable, charitable foundation that basically gives away other people's money. Um, he's not the kind of person you'd want to do business with unless you uh, were a shark yourself. Uh, yet he's gotten this far. Um, third, Trump effectively uh, uh, insulted his way to the nomination, attacking not only his elite detractors in both parties and the media, but also large segments of the electorate, including uh, particularly Latinos and other minorities and women, and hence uh, widespread perceptions of his bigotry, racism, and misogyny. He's in fact the least popular candidate uh, ever since, national candidate, the general election candidate, ever since surveys have been asking questions about favorability going back to oh, this, the 1970s. Um, going back to the 1970s, he set the record as the least popular candidate. On every one of these questions, he gets especially negative uh, comments from women, minorities, young people. Uh, if you look at, just take one of them, favor, the favorability ratings, average favor, favorability ratings, you can see that uh, women like him less than men. Every, nobody, everybody gives him negatives. That is, the, the unfavorable outnumbers the favorable. This is just the, the difference between the percentage favorable, percentage unfavorable. The unfavorable um, outnumber uh, exceeds the favorable. He's got a deficit with everybody, but it's especially it's bigger for women than for men, uh, bigger for, uh, much bigger for Latinos and African Americans than it is for um, uh, uh, whites. It's bigger for people under 30 or people between 30 and 44 than it is for older people. So there's strong gradients on, on race, on education, uh, and on gender. Um, uh, so there, the, the consequences of his, uh, of his singling out these groups for, for attacks shows up in these numbers as well. Fourth uh, reason he shouldn't be there is that he's ignored base, campaign basics. Uh, he has relatively little television advertising, not much of a ground game, um, and certainly in, uh, in crucial swing states. He's relied on free media exposure, uh, news and tweets. Uh, he did this very successfully in the primary. It's not working so well in the general election because the audience that he has to reach is not the one that he was able to reach during the primary. Uh, but nonetheless, he got as far as he did with the nomination despite the fact that he didn't have anything that looked like a traditional campaign organization and actually spent very little money compared to uh, other pr uh, primary candidates. Despite all of this, he still has a non-zero chance of becoming president of the United States. It's been fading, the chance has been fading, but over the course of the campaign, this is over um, going back to uh, middle of 1950, uh, 20, excuse me, 2015, um, he's been behind on average Hillary Clinton in the horse race polls, but not by that far. 
he hasn't, uh, he hasn't entirely been blown away. And you'd think with those negatives, he would have been blown away. Uh, he never would have gotten here in the first place. OK, that brings up the second question. Why is he not getting, uh, uh, why has he not been blown away? Um, and this is, of course, Hillary Clinton, Clinton's question in this cartoon. It says, uh, it's uh, Trump saying things like, temperament, me good, her bad. Wow, she's not nice. Obama's birth certificate, wow, I, I made him show it, blah, blah, blah. She says, good Lord, most people must despise me if they are willing to vote for that, uh, that bloated orange mess. <laughs> and there's some truth to that. That is, she must be uh, asking a question, perhaps not in such gross terms, uh, that why is it, given him, I'm not just uh, running away with this. Uh, and it's because, and she's, she's glommed onto it, because she also has very high negatives. If you look at the course of her career in, pu in the public eye, going back to uh, 1992, her favorability ratings uh, among Democrats, Republic Democrats, Republicans, Independents in green, and then the national average in brown, has had its ups and downs. You can see she was uh, pretty popular right after the election in 92. She became less popular when she was pushing her um, uh, health care reform. She became more controversial. She became more popular, got more favorable reviews when she was standing by her man during the impeachment, the Lewinsky scandal in the, in the impeachment. She did very well as Secretary of State. During the, while she was Secretary of State, she was clearly the most popular and highly approved member of the entire Clinton administration, including Clinton. She was up in the 60s most of the time. Uh, and that's pretty extraordinary. Once she left office and uh, was about to become heir apparent to, uh, uh, to Barack Obama, all that changed, uh, and her numbers fell. Uh, now, uh, part of that falling is entirely self-inflicted by her. Uh, uh, her extensive use of her private email system uh, for public business was probably the most important thing. She took a lot of flack from Benghazi, at least from the right-wing uh, new, uh, news media. Uh, she also had to uh, answer questions about her relations with donors with her foundation, uh, about her connections to Wall Street and so forth, things that both um, uh, Bernie Sanders and now Donald Trump have been able to exploit to a certain extent. That hurt her reputation across the board, not so much among Democrats as among Republicans um, and then also among independents. That green line there fell off pretty, pretty dramatically. Uh, so if it weren't for Trump, she would be the most unpopular major party candidate ever nominated. Uh, so uh, so the, first, the first reason that Trump is still in the race is because Clinton is not um, is just showing her having problems with Bernie Saunders, uh, Bernie Sanders in the, in the race. She looked like at the beginning it was going to be a cakewalk. It turned out to be a slog. Uh, Sanders came closer than most people expected, but not nearly close enough. Um, but it didn't, the, uh, the effect of his campaign was not beneficial to her reputation uh, or to her favorability among Democrats, okay? Um, now, if we look at, uh, an interesting comparison is this pair of candidates against uh, Romney and Obama in 2012. Uh, we see that Romney, uh, his own party liked him, 88% favorable, 8% unfavorable. The other party didn't like him much, 11% favorable, 83% unfavorable. Compare that to Trump, where he has 60% favorability. This is averages over the last month uh, in his own party, but 30% unfavorability. That's pretty unusual to have that many people in your own party not liking you. Um, and then the proportion of Democrats with negative views of him are, are very high uh, at 91. Uh, Obama, compared to Clinton, it's a, not quite as dramatic a difference. She is less po uh, popular among her own party than Obama was, but not as dramatically so as Trump. Uh, and she's equally unpopular uh, among Republicans as is Trump, and almost as unpopular. Uh, Obama was almost as unpopular. Uh, if you look, if you dig down into, into these numbers, and you ask people, uh, are you very un have a very unfavorable opinion or just an unfavorable opinion? That's when the comparison becomes uh, uh, the most interesting because for Romney, 83% um, uh, or so uh, Democrats saw uh, him unfavorably, but only 48% said it was very unfavorable. For, um, for um, Trump, it's 91% it's, uh, unfavorable, 
and then 80% very unfavorable. <laughs> but that's also true of Clinton. Of the Republicans, 80% think have a very unfavorable unfavor opinion of her. For Obama, it was like 54%, something like that. So there's much more hostility on both sides to both candidates. And of course, this makes it less likely that rep even the Republicans who really don't like Trump very much are going to defect to Hillary Clinton because they like her uh, uh, even less. Among independents, uh, they're both equally unpopular, uh, about 82% favorable, or 32% each favorable. It was about 50% for both Romney and, and uh, uh, Obama in 2012. Uh, now, a second problem, a second, uh, Clinton's problem has been doubts about her integrity. These are the, the green lines are the same ones I showed you for Trump. I've just added the numbers for Hillary to them for comparison here. Uh, and as you can see on things like corrupt, uh, a larger proportion see her as corrupt than, uh, than, uh, than uh, Trump. Honest and trustworthy, about the same. They're both equally negative on that. On favorability, she's a little bit better off, but not dramatically so. But on other things, she is much better off. People don't see her as a racist or as crazy, uh, as not qualified, as not the right temperament, as not prepared to the same degree as, uh, uh, as Trump. But the negatives on her side have to do with her personal character, her honesty, her trustworthiness, uh, and the perception that she's something of a cold, self-serving, calculating woman. Um, now, the second reason that uh, she hasn't blown him away is that she shares Obama's legacy among ordinary Republicans. Uh, Obama has been the most polarizing president we've ever had. I thought George Bush, George W. Bush was going to set that record. I wrote a whole book on it. Uh, and lo and behold, by a small margin, um, Obama has been more polarizing than Bush. Republicans really don't like him. They haven't liked him since the beginning. A large proportion of them have actually continued to believe the uh, uh, McCain-Palin depiction of him as a radical leftist uh, with a funny, funny sounding foreign name who may not have been born in the United <laughs> States, probably a Muslim. All that stuff is still there. Uh, and there's uh, very high levels of hostility toward Clinton among ordinary Republicans, as, as indicated by the flatlining at about 10% of his approval rating among Republicans. Meanwhile, Democrats uh, and, and independents have kind of gone up and down, but they're on an upswing now, probably because uh, it, it's a matter compared to what? Uh, how do you think, you know, what do you think of, what do you think of uh, Barack Obama these days? Do you approve? And said, well, yeah, compared to these other people I've been watching, he looks pretty good. So his numbers have gone up independent of anything else I, I think he may have done. Um, but this is, this polarization on, in part, partisan differences in evaluations of president is a very good indicator of overall partisan polarization in the electorate. Uh, you look at, uh, this is quarterly averages of the gap between the president's party and the other party. Uh, partisans in evaluating the president's performance. And you can see that for, uh, for Eisenhower through Carter, uh, the gap was relatively small, 30 to 40 points, something like that. It went up and down. Um, uh, uh, with, with Reagan, uh, GHW, Bush, and Clinton, it goes up again. It goes up by another 15 or 20 points on average, if you look at that. And then another step increase uh, uh, with GW Bush. This was right after 9-11. Right uh, a year and a half after that fades, uh, he becomes the most polarizing uh, president on record until you get to uh, Obama just before he was reelected in 2012. You also notice that those peaks, that there's a little point, comes in the last quarter of the election year. Uh, po uh, electoral politics polarizes us kind of automatically on these, on these kinds of questions. Now, the reason this, this dogs Hillary Clinton is now she is perceived by Republicans as a third term for Hillary Clinton. One of the ways of seeing this is to look at Republican perceptions of the ideological location on the left-right spectrum uh, of, uh, of um, uh, Barack Obama compared to where the Democrats put him. The red, the red column is where the Republicans put him, which 63% in, uh, in these polls have him on the far left, very liberal, 18% liberal, and the rest a handful uh, something else. Democrats see him as either a liberal or a moderate. Uh, that's their kind of perception of him. This difference in perceptions of the ideological location of a president or a presidential candidate are larger for Obama than, than any previous candidates. 
Uh, Republicans think he's a wild-eyed wild -eyed lefty. Democrats, yes, I'm kind of a moderate, middle-of-the-road middle Democrat. You get the same kind of division on, Hill, on Clinton now, where 61% uh, of the Republicans place her at the far left, whereas 47% of the Democrats think she's a moderate. Uh, so you go back and forth on this, and you see that uh, for Republicans, she just looks like Obama. Uh, and that's yet another reason why they are reluctant to abandon her, even if they have very negative views of their own candidate. Um, third, Republicans found, uh, Obama, excuse me, Trump found a theme and with it a constituency that enabled him to take over the Republican Party and thereafter was able to bring most ordinary Republicans who had opposed his nomination back into the fold. Uh, Trump dominated the primary field by mobilizing uh, anti-immigrant, anti-Mexican, anti-Muslim, anti-Obama, and anti-globalization sentiments that were out there, that were simmering uh, in a substantial <coughs> subset of ordinary Republicans, uh, and not a few independents. Uh, his bullying, vulgar, hyperbolic trash talk, which was unleashed against his opponents in his party, in the other party, in the media, anybody, actually tapped into a very rich vein of right-wing populist disdain for cultural, corporate, and political elites. And that, of course, most emphatically includes Hillary Clinton uh, on, on all those grounds. The fact that what, uh, what much of what Trump said was self-contradictory, wildly misinformed, flatly untrue, uh, that he made fantastic promises that uh, were untethered to any discernible reality of things he could could and could not do, doesn't phase his supporters in the least. They don't care. They've been totally immune to fact checking. They're not interested in facts, and, and they, uh, they just don't believe the mainstream media that, uh, that report the fact checking things anyway. So they, they discount it entirely. And even if they don't believe that he can do what he promises, there are a lot of Republicans who support him who don't really think he's going to build a wall. On the other hand, they, they, want, they, they like the aspiration, they like the sentiment, they want to hear it from him. And the fact that he's not going to do it, it's OK, he's going to try, or he's going to say he's going to try, and that's enough. Um, this, is, this approach, yes, this, this, his approach and its success is absolutely unique in modern American politics. Nobody's got that far with this before. Uh, it's something ironic that with Trump's disdain for losers, this is a label he has applied liberally to his uh, detractors, it was ironic but not surprising that his appeal is largely to people who feel like losers themselves. Quinnipiac did a very nice poll in March when they asked uh, uh, the remain, uh, about the remaining candidates who people supported and then asked them que questions about their perceptions of life in the times. Um, first question, has America lost its identity? Of the Trump supporters, the, the brown and the, the brown is, is uh, strongly agree. Um, uh, somewhat, the other was uh, the uh, oranges somewhat agree and the blues in two degrees of, of uh, disagree or strongly disagree. So you can read it from a distance. 85% of the Trump supporters think America has lost its identity uh, compared to 28% of the Clinton supporters. And there's this range between Trump, Cruz, Kasich, Sanders, Clinton uh, uh, along this dimension. 78% of the Trump supporters think they are falling behind economically compared to 33% of the Clinton supporters. 91% of the Trump supporters think their values are under attack compared to 33% of the Clinton voters. 80% um, of the Trump supporters think that the government has gone too far in assisting minorities compared to 15% of the Clinton supporters. Uh, everybody believes the government doesn't, uh, public officials don't care much about them but there's a, still a difference between the Trump supporters at 90% and the, the Clinton supporters at 61%. And then finally, do we need a leader who will, uh, do, a leader who will say or do anything to, get America, to solve America's problems? 84% uh, of the Trump supporters agree with that. Hillary Clinton, 37%. So you have very clear evidence of a substantial group of people who are strongly alienated, very unhappy, um, with their circumstances, with circumstances of the country, and they see Donald Trump as their vehicle for solving that. Now, uh, most of his uh, supporters share Trump's rejection of Republican or economic orthodoxy, at least with regard to free trade. 
Uh, they oppose changes like he does in Social Security and Medicare. Um, they uh, oppose deference to Wall Street, U.S. Chamber of Commerce. They, uh, although Trump does, the most uh, of the Trump supporters are not big fans of tax cuts for the rich uh, or deregulation necessarily. They're not. They're not uh, right wing on the uh, on the small. They're, they're not necessarily small government right wingers. Um, the most powerful draw, though, I think has been his promise uh, of an immigration policy consisting of a wall on the Mexican border, mass expulsions, and exclusion of Muslims. It's the, it's the xenophobia that I think is, uh, is probably the most powerful uh, attractant uh, that uh, got him where he is. Uh, when Trump vows to make America great again, many of his followers and many of his detractors here make America white again. And there's a clear strain of white identity politics Behind, uh, as a force within his candidacy. You have people who are, uh, 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 it's an appeal that goes primarily to uh, white, and especially white males without college degrees, who feel marginalized socially, they be, feel marginalized uh, economically. Um, uh, they're economically vulnerable, they're no longer the center of American culture uh, in terms of what Americans are supposed to be like, and it makes them very uncomfortable. Um, they, uh, this makes them share or attracted to Trump's disdain for political correctness, uh, and they view his vulgarity as authenticity as opposed to vulgarity. Uh, they think that social programs, other than Social Security and Medicare, which they, which they get, uh, serve only minorities and immigrants rather than people like them. They feel abandoned with some justification by politicians in both parties. Uh, life has not been going their way, and they don't see it changing anytime soon. Um, so when Trump rejects the mainstream media, the establishment politicians and intellectuals on both sides of the aisle, uh, he actually strengthens his, his appeal to this kind of base. So Trump has been able to create a base and then add to it uh, Republicans who are with him because they're Republicans, uh, if, if for no other reason, and because they don't like Hillary Clinton. Um, uh, so by and large, he's been able to uh, put, to, not entirely, but to a good extent, reassemble the public, uh, Republican coalition. If we look at uh, partisans voting intentions over the, uh, over the months from July, August, September, October, um, you can see that the most voters, uh, large majorities of both parties say they're going to vote for their own party's candidate, but these numbers are a little lower than they were in 2012. They were up in the 90s, the low 90s for both Republicans with Romney and Democrats with Obama in 2012. Hillary Clinton has managed to bring her coalition back somewhat more effectively than Trump has. Uh, he's got about 80% saying they're gonna vote for him now. But also noticed on this bottom line, very few people are saying they're gonna vote for the other party. There's some saying that they're not gonna vote or they haven't made up their minds, but the number, uh, proportion who say that they're going to vote for the other party's party is, is really quite low. And you may not think this is remarkable because that's the way the world has looked for the last 20 years. But if you go back to the last time a major party nominated somebody really unpopular, say Goldwater in 64 or McGovern in 72, you had in 64 something like 27% of Republicans at the same time saying they were going to vote for Johnson rather than Goldwater. And they did. The post-election polls suggest that they did. Same thing with McGovern. It was more, like 35% of Democrats said, no, nah, they're going to vote for Nixon. Uh, well, we weren't as polarized then, and it wasn't so unimaginable for a Republican to vote for Johnson or for a Democrat to vote for Nixon. Uh, we are now much more polarized, and it's much harder for people to imagine voting across party lines. And that has helped keep Trump where he is. Finally, the fourth thing, there's four things on each side. Uh, the fourth thing is that the context in 2016 should have favored Republicans in general. Uh, it's unusual for a party to hold the White House for three consecutive terms, at least since uh, uh, FDR. Uh, it happened with George W. H. W. Bush in, in 1988. He was the only one who succeeded. There have been six, who, six people who have tried to succeed a two-term president of their own party. Only one of those six has won. So just by that alone, by the it's time for a change kind of sentiment, uh, this should have been a good year for Republicans. Secondly, the economy has not been going gangbusters. It's not terrible but the growth is one, one and a half percent. That would not be enough to offset the time for a change sentiment if the world were uh, as it used to be. Um, so 
Uh, this nonetheless does help Trump in the sense that there are a lot of people out there ready for a change. Uh, he's probably more of a change than uh, many of them can stomach, but some of them are willing to are willing to buy into that. So it's those four circumstances that I think have kept the election at least as close as it is, uh, and still with some uh, small but appreciable prospect of Donald Trump winning it. Um, the state of play right now, uh, oh, this is, this is one I, I had to throw in here just because it's, it's kind of fun. Um, you know those questions about whether he's crazy or honest? Who, who's crazy, who's dishonest, who's qualified or not? Uh, notice that among the Clinton voters, 12% uh, th think she's corrupt, going to vote for her anyway. Uh, only 72% uh, say she's not corrupt. The rest are, are more, less candid and say they don't know, so they don't have an opinion. Um, fewer of them think she's crazy. Most of them say, 85% uh, say she's not crazy, but still, 9% uh, of them uh, who vote for her says she's crazy. Uh, but they do overwhelmingly see her as qualified. Uh, for Trump, you have 15% who thinks he's corrupt, uh, only 74%, only slightly more higher uh, number than uh, Hillary supporters. Trump supporters think he's corrupt. Um, uh, only 81% say he's not crazy. 12.5% uh, 12, 12 say he is crazy. They're going to vote for him anyway. Uh, I'm not, I've never had data like this before to look at, but, this, but, but, but it really is, strikes me as strange that you would say someone who was unqualified, crazy, and corrupt, you were going to vote for him anyway. Uh, it tells you how much you dislike uh, the opposition on the other side. Okay, the, the state of the play right now, this is uh, um, kind of averages, uh, smooth averages of uh, support for Clinton and Trump over the uh, period from June, uh, after the nomination, or after June, through now. Um, there's been a couple of moments when it's gotten fairly close, but on average, she's had a lead throughout this period. The lead's a little wider now, uh, so it's, uh, many people are saying it's all over. Maybe it is. Um, you, can, you can read that as that way. Uh, the second, de uh, the, uh, the debates certainly hurt him and helped her, uh, especially the first two. Uh, and so uh, that, that shows up in these numbers as well. If you look at state by state, um, overall, she national lead six or seven points, but she's also leading most of the uh, competitive swing states that have to be won to win the Electoral College. Florida, North Carolina, Virginia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Colorado, Nevada. Pretty close in Ohio. She's about, it's about a toss-up. Uh, but Arizona's in play. Iowa's in play. Some people have even talked about Texas being in play, which would be really weird. Uh, if uh, she came anywhere near close in Texas. Uh, and that would be a harbinger for, uh, for the future uh, if she did. But by and large, she's in good shape uh, for the Electoral College as well as nationally. Uh, and uh, the odds on her winning are anywhere between uh, uh, 85 and 95 percent, depending on which pollster or which, which guru uh, who uh, accumulates polls and sifts them um, has decided uh, today. Um, the remaining question then is how big will the victory be? And that's really important because that will determine what happens at the House and the Senate. Uh, I, I, it'll depend, the size of the victory will, will depend on several things. Turnout, uh, how the undecideds break, whether they show up at all, whether uh, Trump is able to mobilize his people without having a, a ground game, uh, whether uh, Clinton is able to mobilize young people and minorities, who will support her but are not necessarily enthusiastic voters all the time. Uh, so turnout's going to be very important for that, and we just can't predict that. The second thing we can't predict is how many people are going to split their tickets. Uh, Republicans are going to come out and not vote for Trump, but they're going to vote for a, a, a Republican. Um, it used to be people split their tickets all over the place. If you go back to 64 or 72, you get rampant ticket splitting. Lots of people voted for, for Johnson, but then voted for the local Republican. Lots of people voted uh, for Nixon, but then voted for the local Democratic congressman. Um, that hasn't happened much in recent years. Ticket splitting has hit an all-time low in 2012. And the number of districts that delivered split, split verdicts, as a majority for uh, president of one party and majority of the House for the other party, in 2012 was 29 out of 435, 6.5%, 6 6 7%. A 
district split. That's the, by far the lowest since we've had data on district level presidential and congressional voting. So the, past, the recent past has been very little ticket splitting, which would bode ill for, uh, for the Republicans, I think, this time around. Um, but uh, Trump is unique enough so that he may inspire a lot of Republican ticket splitting. Uh, in which case, uh, things like the incumbency advantage will go up again. It's been going down. Um, and we'll see less of the kind of party line consistent outcomes that we have observed in the last few elections. We don't know whether, I don't know whether that's going to happen or not. We don't know whether that will be the, the reality or not. But it's uh, uh, something that I will be looking for on Wednesday and Thursday of, a, of election week, trying to figure out what's happened. Uh, to win control of the House, the Republicans really, re uh, Democrats really have to have a fantastically good year. And this is because the Republicans have a very strong structural advantage in the House in the distribution of their ordinary voters. There's lots of ways to see this. The easiest way to think about it is 2012 again. Obama wins by 5 million votes out of 124, 100, 126 million cast. Wins by 5 million votes. Romney has a majority of the presidential vote in 229 districts. Obama has a majority in, 200, uh, in 209 districts. Uh, so Obama wins big in very Democratic districts, and that, that's fine for the Electoral College. But it means that Republicans are more evenly distributed across districts in small towns, suburbs, small cities, so that their voters are more efficiently used in winning the House than are Democratic voters. Democratic voters tend to be concentrated in big cities. Um, and it's largely for demographics. I mean, 80% of its demographics, 20% is gerrymandering. Demographics are cities attract people who are young, who are minority, who are gay, who are educated, all of these things that make them um, uh, find, find the Democratic Party a more comfortable home than the Republican Party. Um, and those demographics work fine for presidential elections. They don't work so fine for congressional elections. That means that for the Democrats to win the House, if you, if you just said, all right, what was the average share of the vote you'd have to add to what the Democrats got in, two, the, Democrat got in the district in 2014 to get them up over 50% plus one? Seven percentage points, a seven percentage point swing. That's a very big swing. It's happened. It's not unprecedented, but it's a very big swing. Of course, the swings aren't going to be uniform. It'll be targeted on districts. But you can see what the, the, the uh, basically what the Democrats have to do is win every, de every di district that leans Democratic, every district that's kind of balanced between the two parties, and maybe a half a dozen Republican-leaning districts, all of them. And then they can get a majority. Odds are against it. It's not impossible, but uh, I, I'm, I'm I'm not predicting it. I mean, I, I, I think I'll be surprised, or rather delighted, uh, if it actually happens. The Senate's a different story. Uh, they have, Democrats have a very good chance of taking the Senate. Partly it's because 24 of the 34 seats, um, oh, this is, oh, I'll skip that. Uh, looking, at the, looking at the Senate, um, the Democrats hold 10 seats, Republicans 24 seats. All of the green ones there are in the toss-up category. All but one of them are in the Republican camp. And then there are two in the Rep Republican seats that are leaning Democratic. Kirk, Kirk seat uh, in Illinois, is, uh, his opponent's winning. Johnson's opponent's winning uh, in, the, in the current polls. So all the Democrats have to do, really, is of those toss-ups, win, I think, three of them. And they will uh, have 50. And if they win the White House, that'll give them control of the Senate with a tie-breaking vote exercised by Cain. Uh, the, uh, again, the, the odds makers, the prognosticators, give the Democrats right now about a two-thirds chance of taking the Senate. Six, about 66, 30, 35, uh, 66, 34, 67, 33, somewhere in that range. So what's the likely outcome? The status quo. We're going to go all through, through all of this. Hazarai, if you want to call it that. All this stuff. And we're going to end up with just what we've got now, either post-2012 or post-2014, depending on what happens in the Senate. Uh, if, it's, if, if the Democrats win the Senate, it's post-2012. We're going to have Hillary Clinton in the White House, a Republican uh, House, with it's going to be at least as intransigent as it is now, because the people who elect those Republicans to the House dislike Hillary Clinton just as much as the Republicans who elected the current House dislike Barack Obama. Uh, and their strategy of obstruction uh, will be supported by that constituency. And if they do anything but obstruct, 
they like to run into a lot of flack from people back in their districts, and they know it. Um, the, the Senate can go either way. If, it's, if, the, if the Republicans hold the Senate, then it'll be very interesting to see if we have any more judges ever again, uh, at least on the Supreme Court. Uh, I don't think they will actually go that far, but they'll talk it. You know, it, it, it it's already been kick, kicked around. The Democrats win the Senate, and the re Republicans continue to obstruct. That I think they'll do to the Supreme Court vote, that they, what they did to the regular federal judge vote, and just turn it into a majority vote. Uh, that precedent is now set. Uh, it's hard. The filibuster may be a victim of partisan polarization, uh, and I would have mixed feelings about that, depending on whether my party is in the minority or the majority. Um, in, e in either case, uh, uh, the status quo is likely to persist. And we, if you didn't like what you observed over the last two to four years, you're not going to like, I think, what you observe over the, uh, over the Clinton administration. I may be wrong. I've been, I tend to be pessimistic about these things. But I don't see any breaking of the logjam. The real battle, though, to be watching will be within the Republican Party, to a lesser extent, within the Democratic Party for their future. Uh, Republicans, if they lose, uh, are going to have a bloodbath within the party uh, over whether it's going to be the Donald Trump's party or somebody else's party with uh, many people trying to pick up the pieces. And I have no idea how that's going to land. Democratic side, uh, if, if uh, Clinton wins, she's going to find uh, she's going to be under pressure from the left wing of the, of the Democratic Party uh, and, not be, and won't be able to respond very effectively to it, given that she's not going to have the, uh, 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 enough votes in Congress to do anything. So she may win, end up fairly unhappy. And then finally, on, another, on a, yet another happy note, the odds on a depression, uh, excuse me, a recession hitting us in the next four years are pretty high. We haven't had one for quite a while. They usually have one every once in a while. Might not be bad. Uh, but it's not going to be helpful to whomever's in the White House uh, when it happens. So it's not, a, it's not a rosy scenario. I will, since I assume you're most Democrats in this room, but maybe I'm wrong, I'll give you a slightly rosier scenario by looking, looking forward to the future uh, electorate. Um, if we look at uh, support for the, uh, the major party candidates, Clinton and Trump, in this, in this campaign, you can see there are really strong generational differences. And among the younger generation, uh, whether you, uh, it's just Clinton, Clinton versus Trump or Clinton versus Trump, Johnson, uh, et cetera, um, younger voters, the younger they are, the more supportive they are of the Democratic candidate. And as we all know, people age and kind of exit the electorate at the, at the top end of this scale over time. Uh, and this is, this is important because uh, another thing that's important about this election is that a certain amount of generational imprinting takes place on people when they first become politically aware, politically conscious, uh, come of political age. This is based on 400,000 respondents to every Gallup poll taken between 2009 and middle of uh, 2015. So it's a huge number. And, and the question asks, it just shows at given the age, uh, given the year they turned 20, what is their current partisanship? So you can see from this that, for example, uh, people who turned 20 during the, Car or during the Reagan administration are more Republican than they are Democratic. Same, same is true of the Eisenhower administration. Uh, for those who turned 20 during the Nixon and Ford administration, they tend to be Democratic, not Republican. So there's a kind of imprint of the politics, of the political conflicts and, and divisions that were in place at the time people entered the electorate. Look at what's happened over the last three administrations. The people entering the electorate have been increasingly Democratic, uh, decreasingly Republican until uh, through the Bush administration. They're little, Republicans doing a little bit better under Obama. But there's this huge gap. And if the, if the generational imprinting story is true and continues to be true, then this generation's coming of age during the most recent administrations are going to give Democrats a long-term advantage. Now, it's not because, and there's a fundamental reason for that which is demographic. That is, this is the same numbers, people, the age at which, or the year at which they turned 20, what their, uh, what their ethnicity is. Uh, and it's hard to see here, but at that point, it's about 50-50. Among people just entering the electorate, about half are white, half are non-white. 
Biggest growth among Hispanics, um, not quite as much growth, but some growth among African Americans and among others, uh, Asians and others as well. So uh, you put those two things together, and uh, there's a, a, a long-term future that looks really bleak for the Republicans if they go the way of the Trump party. And the having, having Trump as their uh, standard bearer this time around has probably hurt them in the long run quite, uh, quite decisively. So with that, I will stop and take questions. Great. Thanks. Um, yes, Mr. Johnson. A quick question. Uh, a lot of Trump's appeal is his xenophobia. And you see that on the global stage with the Brexit vote and the French are blowing the wall, you see some correlations there globally. Yeah, the same people. Probably repeat it. Oh, yeah. This, uh, yes. Is there any, is, does Trump have parallels overseas? Absolutely. Uh, he appeals to the same kinds of people who feel like they're losers to globalism. That you find that it's inspiration for Brexit, it's inspiration for uh, conservative party, right wing parties, populist parties in France, Germany, Austria, I'm sure elsewhere as well. Uh, and it's the same kind of people, people who's, uh, who uh, are not, they feel themselves increasingly marginalized in a, in a global society, in a cosmopolitan society. There's an old social science distinction between cosmopolitans and locals. Uh, and, the same demographics going forward for them as you see. Uh, certainly in, in terms of, uh, of yeah, uh, if you're talking about Britain, and yes, these countries as, as their immigrant populations become integrated and become voters, they'll form a larger proportion of the population, which means the remaining white population gets more and more concerned and worried and feeling like they're, they're not in their country anymore. Um, yes. It sounds, it sounds as if you're not too worried about one of the other parties taking so many votes away from Clinton as to propel Trump to win. No, I don't think so. I, I, I think that Johnson attracts voters from both parties. <coughs> His he picks up liber libertarian Republicans. He picks up young and naive Democrats. I, I think that uh, uh, Jill... Her name escapes me right now. Stein, Stein is, is going to be in decimal, you know, single digits, uh, single below single digits, below single digit, low. So they'll siphon a little bit away, but I think the stakes are perceived as being so high. Uh, I, 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 their, their numbers keep going down in the polls. They're down, uh, down to five or six percent. I think they'll be half that maximum uh, when the election rolls around. Um, Ira, some of you might, might know that uh, my foundation registers high school students in our own seven states around the country. And so I just wanted to uh, second what you said about uh, the demographic shift. Uh, those are 17 and 18 year olds. And clearly, in terms of uh, we're in 150 high schools right now, these are a much more generous group of people. They're biracial, they date biracially, they socialize biracially, and most of their life has been a black president, now followed by, by a woman president. And I think all of that really bodes well in terms of 2018 and 2020, because that's where the critical changes are going to have to take place with respect to really trying to get something. It's, it's always good to have demographics on your side, but they move slowly. These things change slowly. Um, Chuck, my class. As a young nonpartisan voter, just on your last statement, I'm just curious if you could articulate why you characterize Democrats that might support Johnson as naive. Well, if if you don't see a, if you see no distinction between Trump and Clinton. It's just, it makes zero difference to you which one wins. Then you go for anybody. It doesn't matter. If you think that uh, it matters whether Clinton or Trump wins, um, I mean, if you're in California, it doesn't matter what you do. But in general, but in general you, it, uh, you vote strategically. You vote for the lesser of the two evils. And of course, the object lesson of that is, you know, how, how do you think George, H, George W. Bush became president? It's because people voted for um, Ralph Nader in Florida. 
Uh, Nader had not been on the ballot in Florida. We would have not had a President uh, Bush. We would have had a, a President Gore. Who knows what, how, how history would have developed? We don't know. But it, you can't say it didn't matter uh, uh, how you voted in Florida uh, in, uh, in 2000. So uh, in, in, that, in, in that respect, to, okay. To, to that question, though, because I know what uh, Chad's uh, concerns are, but <clears throat> what, it, what, what he's finding and what the people that, he, that are working with the IBM US in these really staggering numbers of people that are coming to their website and following is they tend to be moving towards independence, not Democrats, not Republicans. So do you have any sense about how that plays out? Well, it's trouble with independence is it doesn't mean anything. It means you're not, it's what you're not, it's not what you are. So you're not a Republican, you're not, you're not a Democrat, uh, you're not a socialist, you're not any, you're independent. But that can mean anything. You had any, any configuration of political attitudes that you could imagine could call itself independent. And it's hard to build like a movement or a party or a, 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 something around a, something as amorphous as independence. It has to, once you give it some content, then some of those independents aren't gonna fit. They're, not, they're gonna drop out because that's not what they are. So it's a, it's a kind of residual category rather than an active thing to be. Uh, because once you get down to actually de deciding what kind of policies you want to promote or, or pursue, what kind of um, candidates you'd like to support. Um, uh, Lawrence? Aren't most of the people who tell posters that they're independents, aren't they rather consistent Democrats or consistent Republicans? Yeah. And they're voting. About two thirds of them. Yeah. People who, people who you first asked, are you a standard question? Are you a Republican, Democrat, or something else? And people say Republican or Democrat, you ask them, are you a strong Democrat or a not so strong Democrat? Same for Republican. So you've got two points. Independence, okay, do you lean toward the Republican Party? Do you lean toward the Democratic Party? Gives you a seven point scale from strong Republicans to strong Democrats, weak Democrats and Republicans leaning, and then true people in the middle. Those people in the leaning categories are just as partisan in their loyalties and beliefs as those who are weak partisans. They look exactly like weak partisans in, their, in terms of their behavior. So for all useful purposes, if you're trying to predict elections or account for voting behavior, you treat leaning partisans as partisans uh, because they behave, they look like partisans. They, you know, they walk like partisans, they we'll, act like partisans. We'll do two more. Mr. Braun? Yeah. Uh, I want to ask a question about the graph that you had up there. I'm sorry it's not up here right now. But it, it just seems to me you say the Democrats demographics are a slowly moving uh, area uh, for change. But when I looked at that graph that you showed, the slope of that curve changes, at least to me, dramatically as you get off to the right side. And it would seem from looking at those numbers that the change is like the slippery slope where it goes a little faster and a little faster and then a little faster than that because change is the difference between where you are now and where you were then. And that number in the last 2008 to now is a different number than you had 10 years ago. And I think if that is true, it may not be true, but if it is true, you might see some, some major changes in a lot less time than we have in the past. I think, I think it looks like a, a critical change is, is occurring in the last five, six, eight years. It's a little bit steep in the last four or five. I mean, the, the, the cohorts that came up age in, in uh, the second Obama administration there's a little bit of a drop off. The big change comes uh, be in between the 60s and the, and the 70s. When we open up immigration in the, in the 60s, immigration laws open up. And we take in a lot more immigrants, and that starts to make a difference. But if you want to extrapolate this, it's really easy. The people who are going to be voters 20 years from now, they've just been born. We know. We can look, we can look at census data and tell what the population of voters is going to look like 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 40 years from now. One piece of data, your own data, tells you you're wrong. Right? Uh, and what? It's real simple. Look at folks that are 65 and over. Okay? Yeah. Those are baby boomers. Yeah. Okay? What, what color did they turn out to be right now, according to your data? Red or blue? Uh, they turn out to be more red. More red. Relative. Right. No. And where were they in the 60s when they were baby boomers? Oh, and the, the ones who came of age in the 60s and 70s are more Democratic. The ones who came of age in the 80s are, are more Republican. Here's, you, you, you oversimplify looking at your own data. 
Because the truth is, there's a dramatic movement of change in behavior as people age and go through different life experiences. No, this is. Uh, and no, no, I understand. I understand. No. I, I think I've had this argument with my professors at UCSD. <laughs> and going through the difference of living as a politician versus analyzing the data as a professor. I'm telling you, real people don't live that way. And that's the disconnect that the culture and the political culture has in the country. And what's so dangerous, what's so profoundly dangerous, and what creates an environment where we can sit in a room and feel comfortable saying, there's a whole bunch of people who are just losers, and they're willing to vote for this really vile guy called Donald Trump because they're losers. These are hardworking people who spent their entire lives, and they're not angry and upset because their lives are disconnected so much as they're scared to death about what their children's lives are going to be about. And some of their fears are rooted in, in racial issues and changes in the society around them, but not all of them. And, can, and candidly, most of them aren't. Most of them are rooted in fundamental economic change that's technological, sociological, and changes in and even the, even the terminology and the words that they, 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 they thought they grew up knowing what words meant and then the world changed what words meant. And they're disconnected from their own society. And we have allowed Washington and Sacramento and city halls to live in such little dinky bubbles and insulated from highfalutin theoretical um, constructs about what data says that the political commentary is just as disconnected as all of those people who thought the stock market could be predicted by, all you gotta do is read when genius fails and understands how smart guys got the stock market wrong. And you'll see how all of us who are in the political class are missing a cultural social change that's more fundamental and more dangerous, in my opinion, and we'll do exactly what you're saying. That change is coming faster. I have no idea where it's going. I don't have a clue where it's going. But it ain't going to be this way. Well, people are were born in this thing, and they just keep going to behave the way they historically behaved. I think that that's what's naive. Well, uh, disagree. I like the data, and uh, I believe what they tell me, and I believe what let's, they've let's, told us previous. I, I want to end by you telling us how did you, when did you decide in your life that this is the profession you wanted to follow? How did that come about? Well, that was that's easy. Uh, I, I went to Stanford as a, an 18-year-old, and I was there for two weeks. And I decided I liked being at a university better than any place I'd ever been in my life, and I wasn't going to leave. And then I, had to, and then I had to figure out in what, what you know, what was going to keep me there. I was interested in philosophy, pol uh, political science, history, sociology, economics, uh, all sorts of stuff. And I, I just happened, as a sophomore, to have taken a course. From, uh, from a guy named Martin Shapiro, who was a legal scholar. Uh, I took a couple of courses from him, and my reaction to him was, wow, this guy is really smart. Political scientists are really, really smart. I want to be one of those. It was bait and switch. I mean, I've never met one anywhere near as smart as he was ever since. So I tell that to political scientists, they all laugh. They know about the bait and switch part. Um, uh, but it, it turned out to be something that I found interesting and that I could do. Uh, and uh, it's as simple as that. It's a, uh, it's a big secret of academia. It's the best job on the planet, by far. It's the best gig you can get. Uh, your time's your own, pretty much. There's no heavy lifting. Uh, it's, it's just like, it's a great life if you can do it. If you can't do it, it's... Thank you. You're welcome. With that.